blessed to be with you tonight. Um, I have the opportunity tonight to teach over God's tithe and your offering and also bring you the message as well. So exciting times. It's a true honor. I want to thank my pastors for this opportunity. And I once again thank my Lord Jesus Christ for putting me in this position because without him I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today. So I'm glad everybody was able to make it this evening. It's good to see all your smiling faces. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 uh, if you've been with me the last couple times that I've taught, I've been going over Matthew 6, uh, 33. It's something I've been teaching on, and it tells us that we are to seek the kingdom of God first. Is that correct? Yes. So, with that in mind, we're not going to go to Matthew six thirty three. We're going to remember that Matthew six thirty three tells us to seek the kingdom of God first and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. But I want to look at another version of this, and we're going to go to Luke chapter 12 this evening. Luke chapter 12. This is another count that kind of mirrors Matthew chapter 6, but Luke gives us a little different uh, different version of it, and there's some things in here I think we can take a look at and, and help us understand some stuff. We're going to start in verse 13, and this is... I'm going to give you just a little bit of backstory first. This is, Jesus is, is actually preaching at the time and teaching. I mean, he's doing a great job of, of letting us know about what, you know, the fear of God and, and also to, you know, confess Christ before men. And if, if you look back at the beginning of the chapter in verse 1, it tells you how many people were actually there listening to him teach. It says, in the meantime, when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together so that they trampled one another, he began to say to his disciples, first of all, so that's when he started to tape. There were so many people there. If you can kind of picture this, people kind of rolling over the top of each other to hear him talk, kind of like a, like a Black Friday kind of sale, you know. The people are rushing through the doors, and the things are flying, and people are throwing elbows, and the short people are running to the right because they can get underneath the things to get the things that I need. I had that happen with a friend of mine, so it was kind of nice. She ran off to the side because she could get under the barricade to get to what we wanted first. So it worked out really good for us. <laughs> But anyway, Jesus was teaching some great things. And in verse 13, we pick up here. It says, Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Tell my brother to divide inheritance. So here Jesus is in the middle of preaching, telling about the love of God, telling about coming to Christ. And this guy comes up and says, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now, in verse 14, it says, but he said in him, and what, what's that first word Jesus said? Man. Now, for me, if you look at it, like, man, like you, you, you interrupted something going good here, right? And I don't know if that was the tone that Jesus had or not. But I could just picture it in my mind. He'd be like, man, what are you doing? Like, why, why are you interrupting me, right? Man, who made me a judge or an arbiter over you? And he said to him, take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. Now, when we look at this, the word covetousness is defined as eager or excessive desire, especially for wealth or possessions. Eager or excessive desire, especially for wealth or possessions. So let me give you, give you an example here of, of covetousness. The first part's not the actual example, but I was up in the booth, and Sister Carrie and Brother Jim were giving their testimony of how good God was towards them and how they've, they've got the house that they always wanted. I believe it was an all-brick home, if I'm not mistaken, and which, by the way, the story of the background with the brick, that I really, really enjoyed that. That was awesome because that showed an example of this is the faith that we're going off of, and I've got a picture of it, and I'm going to be going towards this. And so the faith was being built with that single brick that he presented to his wife, which was awesome. So, Now, 
I couldn't really show my excitement too much because I was up in the booth, so I wasn't going to be able to do backflips or anything. Because I figured if I had kicked a, if I would have kicked a, you know, a computer over, all the attention then would have been up there, and I would have just run the whole moment. So, but inside I was doing a backflip. I mean, as I was rejoicing because that is really super exciting news to see the blessing of the Lord be presented that way and to be able to see it coming to fruition. March 10th is when you signed. Is that right? Praise God. So. That was really exciting to see somebody receiving the blessing of God. And if you really care about other people, you're glad when they're doing well. You are really happy when you see other people getting blessed. All right, it, that is something that we should all be rejoicing together on. But, what if I heard that story about them getting a the house and I started complaining about it? Okay? Why are they getting a the house? I want a house. Why are they getting the blessings? I think I should be getting blessings too. I want some of those things. I deserve those things. I'm entitled to those things. This is being covetous. You don't want to put yourself in a position where you shut the door to the blessings of God because you are conscious of what somebody else is getting or has been blessed with, but it's not you. You should be rejoicing and excited for the gifts and the blessings that come on other people's life because God is not a respecter of persons. So what he could do for Jim, he could do for me. He could do for Dan. He could do for Daryl, Julie. So there's no restrictions on that, except when you put the restrictions on him. Amen? So I know that I'm trying to have things in my life. I know that I'm believing for some things. I know my wife Michelle is believing for some things. I know myself and Michelle together as a couple are believing things, and we have our whole family are believing for things. But I can't, as the head of the household, demonstrate somebody else's joy that they're having and not demonstrate the joy for them and to block my own blessings. Because if I looked at Jim's success of getting a house, which is great, and I look at it as like, well, why hasn't mine come? We've been working for this for years. Or, you know, why didn't I get that new car? Or whatever the situation you may be looking at for your blessing, you can't push it off to somebody else's blessing and wonder why you haven't got yours. Because you just shut your door to your faith from working. You just shut the door from God working on the blessings in your life. So that for me was something that kind of stood out as I was studying through some of this stuff. And, and Jesus tells us that, we're not to do this. We're not to be covetous of other people's things. Um, he also tells us, if we look in verse 22, he says not to worry. Not to worry. So let's, let's take a look at that. I know I've covered it, but I'm gonna put, let's put our eyes on it again. It says, verse 22 of the same chapter of Luke 12, it says, Then he said to his disciples, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about the body, what you will put on. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Considering the ravens, for they never sow or reap, which they have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Oh, how much more valuable are you than the birds? And which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit of his statue? So that was, again, we remember the story I was talking about my height. You know, it's like, why am I going to worry about, you know, going in inches? There's advantages to this this frame, you don't hit your head on the doors, you know, different things like that. So why, why worry about things like that when you can't control them? Verse 26, if you, if you then are able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven. How much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, 
nor have an anxious mind or a worrisome mind. Verse 30, for all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. Now, Jesus reminded us here of just how important we are to the Father. Verse 32, which we didn't read, but we're going to read now. It says, Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give the kingdom to you. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourself money bags which do not grow, a treasure in heaven that does not fail, where no thief approach nor moth destroy. For where your treasure is, your heart will be there also. So it shows in verse 32 how God pleasures, finds pleasures in blessing his children. Verse 34 tells us about where our treasure is. There your heart will be also. So now let's go back into the Old Testament. Let's go to the book of Psalm. And I want to read... Chapter 37. And Brother Buzz, we're in the New King James. If I didn't tell you that, I apologize. Verse 1, it says, Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall be cut down like the grass and wither as green herb. Verse 3 says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. God wants you to have nice things. Okay? God wants you to have nice things if your priority is in the right place. If you're seeking Him first. Verse 4 if you ask what you desire, God will give you. Is that what it says? Delight yourself also in the Lord, and He shall give you the desires of your heart. The Bible tells you that God knew us before we were born, right? So he knows what you want before you ever ask him. So God is actually giving you the desires of your heart before you know they're the desires of your heart. So he already knows what you're going to want and what you're going to ask of him. So when you pray, you don't have to go and say, oh, Father, I need this, I need that. It's just like, Go to, go to Father and say, what do I need? You already know what I need. What do I need so that you can show me what I need? And then I can believe towards that versus come to him for things that you already think you need, but you might not even need in the first place. He's going to tell you what you need. He gives you the desires of your heart. And that really stood out. I remember I was like, yeah, he gives you the desires of your heart, but I didn't really realize he gave you the desires of your heart before they were desires of your heart. Amen? So, like I said, there are a lot of things that we as a family are putting our faith towards, things that we are seeking God first, knowing that whether we get these things or not, okay, doesn't really matter to me. Yeah, I would like to have some things to be a big blessing to other people with them. But if we get that, and I am not able to put God first, and I'm seeing those as things that, all right, that's more important to me than my relationship with God, then I don't need them. I don't want them, okay? I want to make sure that from a family standpoint that we are seeking the kingdom first and what we need to do for the kingdom and then we're believing God for these things, then the blessings can come on our life, and we can rejoice in those blessings knowing that He is our source. 
He was the reason that we got these things. He was the reason that we had the faith to get these things because we believe and trusted in him first. Amen? So, I kind of got out of my paragraph there. That's kind of cool. The main, the main thing that we are trying to develop as, as a family, and we're, we're getting better at it, and obviously your faith has to grow and you take steps in your faith, but the main thing that we're trying to, to really establish is God is our source. Say that with me. God is my source. God is my source. God is my source. I'm trying to install that in myself and not look to myself as, okay, I can do it this way. I can get it done this way. I need to look and see how God wants me to do it. I need to realize, God, you're my source. How do I fix this? How do I do this? What is the steps I need to take through you to do what I need to do? And that's something key for me is just to, to establish that as, okay, no matter what happens in my life, no matter if I were to lose a job or to lose a house or whatever, I can always turn back to this word and say, okay, God is my source. If I got to start from ground zero, I've got the word. So now I've got a foundation and I can build on that because God is my source. Amen. So when we talked a little earlier in Luke about the possessions, and I want to go back to that so I can read it. I don't want to misquote it. I'm going to look back at 12 real quick. It says, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one li- one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he possesses. Your life is not defined by what you own, the things that you have. But on the flip side of that, your life is not defined by what you don't have either. So the possessions that you have, the possessions that you don't have, that's not what defines you. What defines you is the relationship that you have with God. And that is a building block, and you can look at that foundation of that relationship and know that I am rich beyond measure, knowing that I have God as my source, God as my foundation. Whatever I have or don't have, is regardless of what they are or what they aren't, doesn't matter. What people think about me, doesn't matter what whatever the situation may be what does God believe in me I am righteous in his his eyes I've got my foundation through him so this is why that with this relationship with God and Jesus this is why we have the honor to show God our respect for him by giving back to him what he has provided to us he has provided us the tithe. He is providing us the tenth of our income for us to show back to his respect. Because it doesn't belong to us anywhere. He's given it to us. All we got to do is turn around and just give it back to him. Right? And as we've learned here recently, and this was new to me, but and I've always thought it was the 90% was what was left over. And this was great revelation is what did God leave us? So when I give the tenth back to God, what's God leaving us? It's 100%. It's 100% of what was given to us. He gave us the tenth to tithe back to him for his honor because it belongs to him anyway. In fact, all of it belongs to him anyway. But what is left over is really the 100%. And that was a true revelation. I'm like, I did not, I never seen that. And when you look at, from my standpoint, this is just my personal experience, seeing where I've come from the fact of, okay, being a tither, not a tither, tither, not a tither, uh, tither, not a tither. But then consistently tithing and consistently understanding and building on that foundation again of God is my source. I've seen the increase in my life and I'm not living paycheck to paycheck. And my family is not having to worry, are we going to be able to get shoes for the kids? Are we going to be able to put them through school? Are we be able to feed them? I got some big bug eyes from the daughter up front. I'm using you as an example. But... We haven't, had to, we haven't had to worry because he said not to worry because he has provided for us because we are religiously, I guess it's not really the word, but we are consistently, let's say that, we are consistently tithing, and that brings the blessings in our life. Amen? So if you would like to sow this evening, there's an envelope in the seat back in front of you. Uh, you can also use our text to give option, which is FBIC plus the amount to 28950. 
If you're wanting to give into the EAV, that is FBIC EAV plus the amount to 28950. We also have the option for the building fund, which is the uh, FBIC building plus the amount to 28950. Brothers, you can go ahead and come on up if you will. Um, this is an opportunity for you to sow back into the kingdom of God. This is an opportunity to present your offerings to God, and then he can turn and bless you off of these offerings. So when you have your offerings ready, which I believe I need to get mine, when you guys and gals have your offerings, just come rejoicing. Praise God. Thank you, Brother Neil. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Father, we just thank you. We just thank you, Father, for this opportunity for our tithe and offerings to be presented to you. And we honor you and we glorify you. And we thank you, Lord, that these offerings will be multiplied and that we will be able to have more seeds so that we can sow into the kingdom of God and that we can be a big blessing to a lot of people. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, gentlemen. Well, again, it's an honor to be before you this evening. Um, last time I was with you was actually on a Sunday morning, which it's been a while since I've done that. It was kind of cool, and I kind of got away from my, my series, but I talked on the Faith in the Covenant, which was a really cool, uh, cool backdrop to go off of. I really was excited for that because when we attended uh, FBIMA, that was one of the topics, as Pastor said, that everybody that really liked it. But that was something that I, re I really enjoyed. And it was something that sparked my interest from the very beginning when we started coming here because I was sitting back there in the back row about where the cameras are, are now. And when Pastor had taught on that, saying that there is blood between us and God, I had never heard of that. Never heard of that. And I was super excited to... to to lean into that more. That was that moment when I scooted up in my chair and I was on the edge of the seat and I was listening at that time. I was listening, but something had my attention. Something had my attention. So that's, that's why on Sunday, the last time I taught, that's what I covered because I sat there and I heard that and, and the, the word that came to me was, your faith grows stronger knowing the covenant you have with God. And that just was a building block I was able to go off of. I really liked it. And I might revisit that again. But uh, we're back into our series of Jesus is. Jesus is. And this one is a very simple thing that Jesus is. It's entitled, Jesus is Lord. And I know we've probably heard that before in several places, but it's time just to kind of explore that. So the word Lord is defined as someone or something having power, authority, or influence, a master, a chief, or a ruler, someone or something having power, authority, or influence, a master, chief, or ruler. It can also be used to adjust royalty. An example of this would be a king. Lord can also show a belief to submit to a greater power. Lord is a term many use as a way to address authority. The word Lord is described, for example, an owner of a home or a country. Um, when we look how this is defined, we can see characteristics of Jesus. There are many instances in the Bible telling us that Jesus is Lord, and I picked out a few that we'll cover this evening. If you... Heard the phrase before, Jesus is Lord. You probably remember in the circles of faith that Kenneth Copeland uses that. And, you know, that, that's his backdrop. Jesus is Lord. And at the end of each service, is Jesus is Lord. And that, to me, was just a, a starting point of like, okay, let's just dig into this a little bit. So let's begin tonight in Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. We're going to read verses 39 through 47. Now, kind of a little backdrop. This is right after the angel Gabriel was sent to God to visit Mary. Mary was informed that she was going to give birth to Jesus and that he would uh, be given the throne to David and reign over the house of Jacob forever. 
So we pick up the story in verse 39. And it says, Now Mary arose in the days and went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and, and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leapt in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now remember, Elizabeth was the mother to John. Okay? John the Baptist. Now, then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord shall come to me? This baby hasn't even been born yet. And she's already identifying Jesus as my Lord. How great is that? How great is that? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leapt in my womb for joy. Blessed is she that who believed for there will be fulfillment in those things which were told her from the Lord. Praise God. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. Praise God. Can you see the excitement of this story? True excitement. Elizabeth's son, which turned out to be John the Baptist, as I mentioned, leaped in her womb for excitement over just the presence of Jesus being there with her. I mean, just walking, you walk through the door, here comes this pregnant lady walking through the door. I mean, I don't know if she's got her hands on her back or waddling or what, but she's coming through, right? But across the room, there was another pregnant woman, and the baby leapt just from the presence of Jesus coming into the room. How satisfying is that? I mean, not to mention the fact that we know that he's in us. How satisfying is that? We should all be that excited knowing that Jesus is living in us. He didn't even have to walk in the room. He's here already. Amen? So, if believers took a moment to just understand that Jesus is truly in them, they should be just as excited as that other unborn child was. They should be as excited as John was when Jesus came into his presence. Now, having a Lord does mean you have to come under the authority and protection of that Lord. And we can see that in our next example. So let's go to Matthew chapter 14, please. 14, Matthew 14. Boldness, Brother Buzz, boldness. Praise God. Here we see a familiar story where Jesus walked on the water. So we're going to read verses 22 through 33. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him onto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. So remember, this was just after the feeding of the 5,000, okay? And when he had set the multitudes away, he went upon the mountain by himself and prayed. Now when the evening came, he was alone there, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, Tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Verse 25. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out of fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Be of good cheer. Do not be afraid. It is I. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, You command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hands and caught him and said to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the winds ceased. Then those that were in the boat came and worshiped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Now, I don't think 
this story truly gets enough credit for the demonstration of the authority that Jesus had. I've always pictured, what, first thing, if you think about Jesus walking on water, you always see pictures, he's walking across, and the, the waters almost look like it's glass. It's smooth, it's easy travel, there's no bumps in the road. But when you look back at this story, these were very large waves crashing upon each other. The, the sea was in hurricane proportions, you could say. And he's walking on the top of these waves and walking towards this boat. And this is just a simple district, uh, description of his authority by him walking on top of those waves. We haven't even got to the point where he calmed the seas and then it did go flat. That was after he got to the boat. But he's walking on top of these waters, and he is showing his authority by walking on top of these waves. And I want to read this story again because there's some insight on it from the Passion Translation. So we're going to read chapter 14, verse 22 again from the Passion Translation. As soon as the people were fed, Jesus told the disciples to get into the boat and go to the other side of the lake while he stayed behind to dismiss the people. After the crowds dispersed, Jesus went up to the hills to pray, and as night fell, he was there praying alone with God. But the disciples, who were now in the middle of the lake, ran into trouble, for their boat was tossed about by high winds and heavy seas. So again, this picture, it's not the flat waters that you would want to have that normal image people put in their minds. This is a very large storm that they're going through in the middle of this lake. The waves are crashing on top of them. And about four o'clock in the morning, Jesus came to them walking on the waves. When the disciples saw him walking on top of the water, they were terrified and screamed, A ghost! Then Jesus said, Be brave and do not be afraid. I am here. Peter shouted out, Lord, if it is really you, then have me join you on the water. Come and join me, Jesus replied. So Peter stepped out onto the water and began to walk towards Jesus. But when he realized how high the waves were, he became frightened and started to sink. Save me, Lord, he cried out. Jesus immediately stretched out his hand and lifted him up and said, What little faith you have. Why would you let doubt win? And at the very moment the both, that they both stepped into the boat, the raging wind ceased, and all the disciples crouched down before him and worshiped Jesus, saying, In adoration, you are the true Son of God. Peter lost sight of seeking Jesus first because his attention was drawn to the size of the waves. Peter put himself in a position to let doubt win his situation. And it just goes to show you how simple that you can be put into a situation without Jesus not seeking him first, and then all this trouble comes upon you. He began to sink. It's not like he was underwater. He just began to sink because his focus shifted from Jesus to, oh, look at these waves. And he started to sink. I don't want to go down too far because I'll get behind the pulp and you can't see me. <laughs> but the key to that was the fact that he lost sight of what was most important, was keeping his mind on Jesus, seeking Jesus first. So now let's turn over to John chapter 13 for another example. John 13. I'm hoping I'm helping everybody tonight. This is helping me a lot. So you can see back when we, before we move on to 13, you could also see as a recap that they were identified Jesus as Lord because they had already had put themselves in a position to understand his authority, and, you know, Peter had called him Lord, if it is you, you know, let me come to you, so that's something I, I just I went over, I forgot to mention that, but I want you to see the type of Lord that we serve. Jesus was not the type of Lord that ruled with an iron fist. He did not have the people follow him out of fear of what he might do to them. Jesus was on the same level as God, yet Jesus humbled himself and became a man. 
Jesus was shown his obedience to God and followed what his father sent him to do. So, in this example of chapter 13, Jesus is going to show love. Jesus is going to show how he was humble. And he's going to show his compassion to his disciples. So, chapter 13, verse 1. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come and that he would depart from this world to the Father... Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel with which he had girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? So again, he's identifying, you're my Lord. There's authority here, okay? And Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. So at one point, he's like, no, man, no, nah, my feet are good. You, you know, it stink a little bit. You don't need to be doing it. But then he realized, wait a minute, there's something more to this. Okay, do my hands too. Do my head. Just wash me. Wash me, right? He's accepting that authority of the Lord. Praise God. You know, when you look at your Bible and you were listening on this side, I was looking on the left side. I apologize. <clears throat> Jesus said to him, he who bathes needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he said he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord. And you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Jesus was using his position of Lord to demonstrate how a ruler should be, how a ruler should act. Again, I'm going to go back to my Passion Translation because I just like how this really sticks out. Sometimes this version just simplifies things and puts it in a different perspective. Chapter 13, Passion Translation. Verse 1, Jesus knew that the night before Passover would be his last night on earth before leaving the world to return to the Father's side. And although his time with his disciples, excuse me, Although all throughout his time with the disciples, Jesus had demonstrated a deep and tender love for them. And now he longed to show them the full measure of his love. Wow. His full measure of his love. Before the evening meal had begun, the accuser had already planted betrayal into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now Jesus was fully aware that the Father had placed all things under his control. For he had, come back, he had come from God, and he was about to go back to be with him. So he got up from his meal, he took off his outer robe, took a towel, and wrapped it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' dirty feet and dry them with his towel. But when Jesus got to Simon Peter, he rejected and said, I cannot let you wash my dirty feet. You are my Lord. Jesus replied, You don't understand yet the meaning of what I'm doing, but soon... It will be clear to you. Peter looked at Jesus and said, You'll never wash my dirty feet. Never. But Peter, if you don't allow me to wash your feet, Jesus responded, then you will not be able to share life with me. That's a big statement right there. Not be able to share life with me. So Peter Peter said, Lord, in that case, don't just wash my feet. Don't just wash my feet. Uh, If I can't be with you, then okay, wash my hands and my head too. Jesus said to him, you already clean. You've been washed completely, and you just need your feet to be cleansed. But that can't be said of all of you. 
for Jesus knew which one was about to betray him, and that why he told them that not all of them were clean. After washing their feet, he put, the robe on, he put his robe on and returned to his place at the table. Do you understand what I just did, Jesus said? You've called me your teacher and your Lord, and you're right, for that who, that's who I am. So if I'm your teacher and your Lord and have just washed your dirty feet, then you should follow the example I've set for you and wash another's dirty feet. Now do for each other what I've just done for you. So he was showing a great example. He humbled himself, and he put himself in a position that he wasn't using his authority to, to, to beat him down or to show him who was boss. He was showing the compassion of what a Lord should have. Amen? Jesus wants you to see what it truly means to the Lord, yet also to be a servant. He was here, or he was again here showing us how to truly be the best Lord and the one that we should follow. If we turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Verses 29 through 36. 36. This is, again, Peter's addressing the crowd after the upper room was filled with the Holy Ghost. And in verse 29, Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him of the fruit of his body according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, not of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into heaven, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know surely that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Jesus was given this name because of his obedience to the Father. Jesus followed the plan of God perfectly. Jesus was willingly, he willingly followed the plan, knowing exactly what he was going to have to go through. Yet, Jesus did that for you, and he did it for you, he did it for you, and he did it for me. Someone that is willing to go through that much pain, that much torture, that much humiliation, only exemplifies the meaning of love for someone else. He put others first. He put you first. Praise God. Knowing Jesus has its benefits. Knowing the power and the authority strengthens our faith. Let's look at that. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Turn here too for a moment because I'm going to read Passion again as well. Give me plenty of time to find it. Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to read verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of all his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. The Passion Translation. 
Now, my beloved ones, I have saved these most important truths for last. Be supernaturally infused with strength through your life union with the Lord Jesus. Stand victorious with the force of his explosive power flowing in and through you. Put on God's complete set of armor provided for us so that you will be protected as you fight against the evil strategies of the accuser. Your hand-to-hand -hand combat is not with human beings, but with the highest principalities and authorities operating in the rebellion under the heavenly realms. For they are a powerful glass of demon gods and evil spirits that hold this dark world in bondage. Because of this, you must wear the armor of God provides so you protect as a comfort of slander, for you are destined for all things and will rise victorious. Praise the God. We see the power of Jesus is flowing in us and through us. It is flowing through us because we are supposed to demonstrate the same love that Jesus has to others around us during our daily lives. What Jesus demonstrated for us through his disciples and through everything that he'd done, every part of Jesus' ministry was based off of love. Everything had a foundation of love. Everything that he did. Now we are to spread the news of what is to come and that the love is coming for us. I know that I just kind of scratched the surface and there's going to be more to this. I think there might be a part two to this one. But I just wanted to see how the service of how to show you how the Jesus of the Lord is and how, how if you're saying to yourself, you know what? You might be just scratching the surface, but I heard enough. And I need to know how can I put Jesus first in my life? How can I make him the Lord of my life? How do I make my life complete through Jesus? Well, Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10 tells us exactly what needs to be done. It says, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. If that's you in this room, or if that is you online, and you realize, you know what, it's time to make a decision. Bow your heads with me. If it's time for you to make the best decision of your life and make Jesus the Lord over your life, all you have to do is say this with me. Say, Father, I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that you sent your son Jesus to this earth for us and he died for us. And Father, you raised him from the dead. Jesus, Jesus, come into my heart. Into my heart. Be, the Be the Lord of my life. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. And guide me the rest of my days. Guide me the rest of my days. Amen. Amen. Now, if you said that prayer with us, you are now saved. You are now in the kingdom of God. Amen. And heaven is rejoicing yes. over your decision, yes. your best decision of your life. Yes. Praise yes. God. Well, I hope I helped you all this evening. It was an honor and a pleasure again to be with you. I believe Pastor Michelle will be with us this weekend. Praise God. And we will be flooded with the faith and the power that comes from Pastor Michelle. Amen. So if you all will rise to your feet, please. Thank you, Lord. We will say the vision of our church. The vision of our church will always be to build people's faith and frame their world by the word of God. And you and I will always be world changers. God bless you. Thank you for joining us for this message. We would love to hear from you. If you have a prayer request or want to share how this message has helped you, send us an email at main at buildfaith.net. This message and many more materials are available to you free of charge, can be found at buildfaith.net or at any of our location media stores. As always, keep the switch of faith turned on and build your faith and frame your world by the Word of God.